Well, good afternoon. Time to begin again. And uh, I just want to mention that there is a book table out in the lobby that I don't think we mentioned before. Uh, but please uh, stop there and see what is available. Well, today, this afternoon, we have the enjoyable time of hearing from Dr. Richard Muller, who is the senior fellow at the Junius Institute for Digital Reformation Research and is the Emeritus Professor of the P.J. Zondervan Professor of Historical Theology at Calvin Theological Seminary. He is the author of numerous books and articles, including The Unaccommodated Calvin, Calvin and the Reformed Tradition, and Post-Reformation Dogmatics, as well as many others. Today's lecture is entitled John Preston on the Purpose and Place of the Natural Knowledge of God. So we welcome you, Richard, and there will be a time for questions and answers following. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you. Um, I should note at the beginning that this, this essay or lecture is a little piece of a very big puzzle, and I apologize for not being able to show you the puzzle. Um, the puzzle is the whole story of what's going on in Reformed theology from the late 16th century and its understandings of reason and nature to what's going on in the early 18th century when reason and nature are much more important than even, even prolegomenal, presuppositional. Um, Preston occupies a place in that, um, and I'm going to look at that place. Yeah, let's see this thing. Um, John Preston, 1587 to 1628, was one of the chief formulators of an English reformed theology during the early Stuart era, and the author of a substantial series of doctrinal sermons all published posthumously. Preston served as Dean and Catechist of Queen's College, Cambridge, Chaplain Ordinary to Prince Charles, Master of Emmanuel College, among other appointments. There's no evidence that he opposed episcopacy, and when pressed, he affirmed use of the prayer book. If Puritanism is identified with Presbyterianism and nonconformity, well, then Preston was not a Puritan. If, however, it's identified as a theologically reformed attitude with an emphasis on covenant as having a clear emphasis on personal piety and inward spirituality and is stylistically inclined to a plain style and doctrinal preaching, then Preston fits very well into the trajectory of English theology that fed into Puritanism, the Puritanism of the mid 17th century and contributed to the thought of the Westminster divines. A large portion of Preston's sermons was devoted to the presentation of a homiletical body of divinity that had Preston managed to complete it would have been massive. The exposition of knowledge of God and God's existence and attributes alone extends to 379 pages. His book on covenant and spirituality, just by the way, is 608 pages. So he wrote quite a bit. Um, like other reformed writers of the era, Preston evidences a grasp of the doctrinal content including what could be identified as its contemplative and speculative aspect, but arguably in the spirit of Perkins and Ames, he places his stress on the praxis and practical aspect, specifically the goal of salvation and eternal life concerning which theology instructs and toward which it leads. Scholarship to date has examined Preston's soteriology, his homiletics and piety, and his covenantal thought. Although his forays into the realm of natural or rational argumentation of theology were touched on in two fairly recent studies of early modern Protestant natural theology, these analyses of this thought have offered only a very incomplete picture. In the earlier of the two essays, Preston's proofs of the existence of God are examined in some detail, but there's no further work on the relation of that to the rest of his theology or to theological formulation of the 17th century. In a more recent study, um, Preston's work is portrayed as addressed to the problem of what was called practical atheism and secret objections to the truths of God. Still, despite that apologetic direction, and despite noticing the presence of biblical testimonies in Perkins' rational arguments, that study reads Perkins as contributing to the identification of natural theology as a necessary prologue to the formulating of a sacred or supernatural theology. Um, my own approach is going to take those two 
approach, to views into consideration, but to look more closely at Preston's views on the powers of human reason and for the proper use of reason in theology, including in homiletical theology, and to his understanding of the problem of knowledge, uh, which has received very little attention um, and not been set into the context of early modern English reform thought. In what follows, um, I propose to examine Preston's views on the natural knowledge of God in its intellectual context, with a view to offering a clear perception of his intention, specifically with reference to the place and purpose of exercises concerning natural knowledge of God in the doctrinal and homiletical literature of the era. Yes, I will identify a difference between a rationalist identification of natural theology as a necessary prologue to the formulation of sacred or supernatural theology, which is a standard 18th century model, and Preston's recognition that the natural light of reason is a requisite for receiving the supernatural light of revelation, and his assumption that natural knowing is foundation to all knowing, including religious knowing, and to the formulation of doctrine in sacred theology. Yes, I will also demonstrate continuities and relationships between Preston's version of English reform theology and patterns of argument characteristic of the continental reform. Whereas the rational approach to, rationalist approach to natural theology was never contemplated by Preston, he did assume the use of reason in theology and the correlation of naturally or rationally known fundamental truths about God with supernatural revelation. It's significant also that Preston did not use the term natural theology, uh, which is interesting given that people have spoken of him writing natural theology. He didn't use that term to characterize aspects of his work, even though the term was in use currently in his time in several works by major reformed writers, notably Georges Packard and Johann Heinrich Alstadt, as well as being used in early Orthodox reform theological prolegomena as a term for theology resting on the light of nature. Preston's most extended use of rational argumentation concerning God appears in his book, Life Eternal, a work explicitly denominated by Perkins as the first installment of a projected whole body of theology consisting in heavenly wisdom. For the comprehensive co comprehension of wholesome doctrine as delivered in scripture. That description of the work and its intention by itself indicates something of the place and use of natural knowledge and reason in Preston's work. Their use was integral to a project that was self-consciously biblical as well as homiletical. First, the natural knowledge in Preston's writings. Preston's ventures into the realm of natural or rational argumentation concerning God consist largely in the sermon first published in 1630, entitled A Sensible Demonstration of the Deity, and in the extended argumentation in his Life Eternal from 1631. As much as these are posthumous works, no sequence or development can be demonstrated. Both works date from the 1620s, when Perkins was preacher at Lincoln's Inn, master of Emmanuel College, Cambridge, and chaplain ordinary to the king, and a frequent preacher at the court of James I. Unfortunately, Preston does not cite the sources or backgrounds of his arguments. He uses, for example, the rhetorical argument for the existence of God for universal consent. Um, but he mentions neither the usual classical source of his argument, Cicero, or any of the more proximate sources, such as Calvin's Institutes, Mornay's Trueness of Christian Religion, or Perkins' Cases of Conscience. And it's worth noting, just this morning, I was reading John Robinson, um, who was mentioned in the last hour. Um, and Robinson does use the same argument, and margin, marginally, he puts Calvin in there. So that Calvin's use was something that people were interested in, but in that day, but um, Preston was not. What can be said, is that Preston's argumentation often parallels the patterns of formulation found in other reform writers of his time. His works are all cast in the form of sermons, giving a homiletical context to his views on the extent, the character and use, and the limitation of natural knowledge of God. The sensible demonstration and life eternal share a methodological point with the exposition of proofs in William Perkins' Cases of Conscience and in Johann. Heinrich Allstedt's Tale of inasmuch as they assume a recourse to scripture, both for the sake of identifying the nature of the problem from a biblical or Christian perspective, 
and as an authority to be referenced in the course of rational argumentation. And so, by the way, that means that whatever he's doing as what might be called natural theology consistently has scriptural references in it, uh, which is a wrinkle that you see in early modern natural theologies that you don't see in them today. Perkins begins his discussion of the knowledge of the existence of God by noting two ways in which God is known, as you would expect, one, by the strength of natural reason, and two, by faith. Paralleling the traditional distinction between the two books of divine revelation, nature, and scripture. Beston does not offer a full exposition of ways of knowing, such as one encounters in, in such writers of the era as Sir Matthew Hale and John Owen, who distinguish between basic apprehensions or intuitions and ratiocinative judgments. In the case of Owen, who identify faith, specifically faith in testimony, as a distinct rational function. Fesson's distinction takes a simple route of identifying reason as the means of reception of natural truths and faith as the means of reception of supernaturally revealed truths. His actual method in the sensible demonstration, like that in Life Eternal, assumes a biblical foundation for the deployment of arguments concerning the natural knowledge of God, recognizes the priority of scripture over reason, here inverting the order of the two ways by which the existence and providence of God are known. First, he says, by faith out of the books of scripture, second by reason out of the books of creatures. The argument appears to accept a fairly standard approach among reformed writers of the era, deriving from an authoritative document, person, or group, and appealing to faith, or proceeding by way of inductive demonstration or rational argumentation, appealing to reason. Preston's sensible demonstration takes its point of departure from the text of Isaiah 64.4. Um, by the way, um, although these are written in the 1620s, Preston is consistently using the Geneva Bible and not the King James. Um, the Geneva Bible remained popular long into the, the 20s and 30s, including one printed attempt that I know of to integrate the marginalia of the Geneva Bible with the, with the authorized version King James text, which was a, a major failure. Um, proponents of the marginalia then reverted to the text of the Geneva Bible and used it consistently down on into the, the mid 17th century. In any case, Isaiah 64, four, for since the beginning of the world, men have not heard nor perceived by the ear, neither hath the eye seen another God besides thee, which doth so to him that waiteth for him, that doth so to him that waiteth for him as in the previous verse where God is doing terrifying things. The text in Preston's view expressly points toward a prophetic testimony to use natural knowledge. The prophet paraphrased by Preston argues, indeed, there is the testimony of the scriptures. There is the witness of the prophets and evidence of miracles, thing, things all that are done by the providence of God. But yet, saith he, prophet, I will leave all these things and appeal to the works of nature, even unto the things that the eye hath seen and the ear hath heard. For from them it is manifest that there is a God, that it is he who hath done these terrible things which we have not looked for, from verse 3. What ears and eyes testify, moreover, is not only that God exists, but that God is one, and is the one by whose providence all things come to pass. Truths, Preston says, that are testified in a whole host of other texts, which he cites as some length. Prophetic testimony parallels, and that's interesting, I think, the argument from universal consent. So he doesn't just appeal to universal consent from Cicero or Calvin, without mentioning them. He also appeals to universal consent from scripture. Reference to the eye seeing and ear hearing also echoes Preston's rather Aristotelian understanding of human knowing. All that is in the mind was first in the senses. Seeing and hearing, he wrote, are the only disciplinal senses we have. All the knowledge you have is gathered from the eye and the ear. In both of his works, Preston's interest in natural knowledge of God is both apologetic and practical looking to argue against the secret objections of atheism that can prey upon believers and provide, and he provide then a solid knowledge of God grounded in reason and nature. 
that can reinforce the Christian understanding of doctrine. Knowledge of God, as the authors of his dedicatory epistle write, is a most necessary and effectual means to friendship with him. Preston's purpose then is not to deliver a natural theology as distinct from sacred theology, but instead to offer in a form of a series of sermons, a body of theology or divinity, a system or comprehension of wholesome doctrine delivered in scripture, in which the use of natural reason is conjoined with faith in the exposition of doctrine, and in this case, of divine existence, essence, and attributes. Next then, comments on the relationship of reason and faith. Preston drew on a long and complex tradition for his understanding of the relationship between reason and faith. Here again, it's not possible to identify particular sources of this view, but it's quite clear toward which option he gravitated. Despite his assumption that after the fall, natural men prior to regeneration withhold the truth and unrighteousness, Preston had a positive view of the capability of properly exercised natural reason. There is, he says, a natural truth and a common knowledge in all human beings that includes a basic knowledge of the existence of God, of moral virtue, of good and evil, of justice and injustice. The withholding of truth and unrighteousness, he says, belongs to the condition of human beings in general, inasmuch as they can know truths concerning God, including having a practical knowledge and inclination to the good, but they fail to act on that knowledge or to allow its light to inform their actions. Reason can discern the consent and harmony among creatures. It can, it can understand the fitness and proportion of the creatures unto one another, the apparently reasonable actions even of unreasonable creatures, the order, combination, mutual independence of things, the general workmanship evident in the world. The basis of these abilities of rational discernment lies in foundational principles engraved or imprinted in the soul of human beings, in the traditional language of the era, common notions concerning the existence of God, the requirement of worship, and the basic premises of natural law. Um, common notions, it's, it's worth mentioning, is, is a very ancient notion going back to Stoic and Euclidean philosophy in the ancient world, um, where there are certain things that are in the mind, not necessarily conscious, but they, they, they arise as immediate apprehensions of the reality outside of you. So for example, um, when my son was two years old and barely walking and not saying much, if there was a toy on the other side of the room, he didn't circumnavigate the room to get it. He went straight across the floor. He never did say to me, gee, dad, a straight line is the shortest distance between two, two points. But his encounter with the world around him told him that. And there it was, a common notion in his mind. And you can multiply common notions like that. Um, if you have I'll say two nephews, and each of them has one piece of candy. And you give six pieces of candy to one of them and two pieces of candy to the other. The other will feel jipped, <laughs> even though he doesn't specifically state that when unequals are added to equals, the sums are unequal. Another common notion that is there. In, these, in Preston's mind, the existence of God is one of those. But it, it hits you. You don't, it's not, a, it's not innate, it's not platonic, but it, it hits you as your mind encounters the external reality. His anthropological point is that humanity, fallen in sin, retains relics of God's image that include the proper functions, interrelationships of the faculties, the faculties which continue to reason and to will, albeit sinfully. Quotation, there is a double image of God. First, a natural, standing in the natural frame of the soul as to be immortal and immaterial. So there is understanding, will, and reason, and some sparks of life left in us as the remainder of that stately building that is ruinated. But yet there are no sparks of the living image left in us, the spiritual image of God, consisting in holiness and true righteousness. Sin does not obliterate understanding and reason, 
even as it does not remove the free choice of the will. Rather, it limits reason, damages judgment, and distorts the act of willing. The relationship between reason and faith for, for Preston is predicated on the traditional view that by definition, the human being as distinct from irrational beasts is the rational animal. Where there is no reason, there can be no faith. As Preston indicates, the subject of faith is the whole heart. That is to say, to name it distinctly, both the mind and the will. For faith to be present, the intellect or understanding must assent to the truth of God's promises, and the will must consent to and embrace the promises. On the specific issue of reason, faith is a gift of God that enlightens the understanding. Faith, he says, is but an addition of a new light to reason, that whereas reason is purblind, faith comes and gives a new light and makes us see the things revealed by God which reason cannot do. This is not a simplistic assumption that faith precedes reason, but that reason precedes faith. Faith requires the presence of reason or rationality, while well, reason must operate faithfully in order rightly to acknowledge truths concerning God. The blindness of fallen reason, quite strictly and directly, concerns human failure to appropriate the promises of God leading to salvation. It does not concern basic matters of perception. Reason provides a basis for, quote, firm assent, unquote, concerning natural things. Faith provides a basis for firm assent concerning revealed things of God. Another quote from Preston, reason runs, I wish you could see these because they're spelled so wonderfully, but anyway, <laughs> um, and, I, and I can't pronounce them to show you the spelling, but anyway, reason runs along together with faith, only there is this difference between them. Faith adds to the eye of reason and raises it higher, for the understanding is conversant as about things of reason, as also about things of faith, for they are not propounded to the understanding. Faith helpeth reason to go further. Therefore, faith is but an addition to the strength of reason when it could go no further. Faith makes it to go further. As one that has dim eyes, he can see better with the help of spectacles. So, the, so doth the eye of reason by supernatural faith infused. The simile of spectacles has a history, of course. It was used by Calvin to characterize the function of scripture in clarifying otherwise invisible signs of divine handiwork in the world order. Again, Preston doesn't cite anybody. <laughs> so also, while echoing a long tradition of Reformed theology that reached back to Zwingian and Calvin, Preston notes that theology divides into two parts, knowledge of God and knowledge of ourselves. Concerning God, the knowledge concerns that he is and what he is. The existence of God then is the first topic of the treatise and it can be proven in two ways, by the strength of natural reason and by faith. Preston's principial assumptions here are similar to Allshed's. This is not to be an exercise in pure reason abstracted from faith. Biblical citations will appear within the rational argumentation for the sake of confirmation. And the entire concept of the argument is, after all, homiletical, resting on an initial biblical text. Preface, Perkins prefaces entry into the proofs of God's existence by reviewing Romans 1.20 and Acts 14.17, in order that we do not deliver this without ground, he says. In both places, addressing those who had no scripture to teach them, the apostle indicates that natural reason teaches that God is, or more precisely, that there are two sources of this knowledge of God, namely, that which declares God in the very creation of the world, and the light of understanding or reason put into us, whereby we are able to discern those characters of God stamped in the creatures, whereby we may discern the invisible things of God, his infinite power, and his wisdom. There are then two sources of natural knowledge in theology, revelation in nature and the human reason that discerns it. Preston uses these arguments to raise a question. He asks, has he contradicted himself? given that he previously defined theology as delivered in scripture and as revealed from above. And unlike all other sciences, as taught by the Holy Ghost. The definition remains true, he comments, but needs to be clarified by a difference or a distinction. That distinction, by the way, is one of the few sort of scholastic moves that you can see him making. It's because scholastics just love to make distinctions. Um, so the distinction, some truths are wholly revealed and have no footsteps in the creatures 
no prince in the creation or in the works of God to discern them by. And such are the mysteries of the gospel and of the Trinity. Other truths there are that have some vestigia, some characters stamped upon the creature, whereby we may discern them. And such is this which we now have in hand, that there is a God. The existence of God then can be shown, he says, in two ways, how it is manifest from the creation and how this point is evident by faith. Again, what he's saying is quite parallel. You could find it in Alshed, later in Turretin, and other reformed writers on the continent, as well as various English reformed, who respect the function of reason and general knowledge in theology, and to argue that truths of nature, namely truths of natural theology or natural religion, are not excluded by, but rather are included in and clarified by sacred doctrine. If rational examination of the world order can provide only some of the most basic truths concerning which, or concerning what faith has already known from scripture, one may ask why rational argumentation concerning the existence and attributes of God has any place in theology, particularly in a system or comprehension of wholesome doctrine delivered in scripture. Preston's answer recognizes the apologetic purpose of combating doubts that lead to practical atheism, but also plays places stress on the use of reason to confirm the truth. The proofs, he says, strengthen that principle in us that God is, which is very necessary to be confirmed, seeing it is the main and principal foundation of all Christian religion and can never be sufficiently enough be rammed down, perhaps rammed down someone's throat, um, as being that which must bear all the weight of the building. For certainly, wheresoever the scripture hath a mouth to speak, there it is useful for us to have an ear to hear. Scripture speaks to the ear of human understanding, which can only be strengthened in his hearing by the right use of reason. Seeing beside the testimony of scripture, he writes, there are so many proofs, even from the things that the eye sees and the ear hears that God is, it should strengthen our faith in that first and main principle that God is. On the other hand, Mere reason and argument by themselves are not, so full, are not sufficient to the full apprehension of truth of God, which is above the power of creatures. And therefore it is God only that renews us in the spirit of our minds. Preston's proofs for the existence of God accordingly rests on two points, that God's existence is manifest in the creation and that this point is evident by faith. They consistently support rational argumentation or supported by rational argumentation and biblical texts. The genre of his argumentation, moreover, is the sermon, each one prefaced by an argument with attention to a biblical text. The argumentation itself assumes that faith is characteristic of rational beings. It neither makes faith dependent on the exercise of reason nor renders reason utterly incapable apart from faith. Few words here on faith, reason, natural and supernatural knowledge in explicating the divine attributes. Preston's exposition of the divine existence and attributes was extensive. It was also supplemented in his massive new covenant by a practical presentation of the doctrine of divine all sufficiency. Um, if, if you want to know what all sufficiency means, at the length of 200 pages or so, you should go, go to Perkins, uh, Preston rather. Um, he doesn't emphasize all sufficiency in his uh, line of the last day. He just seems to want to discourse on that um, in the other book, largely as the basis for understanding covenants. What can be observed in nearly all of his expositions of divine attributes, however, is the merger of biblical with rational argumentation. On the assumption that natural knowledge supports and confirms supernatural revelation, but does not add truths about God that are not revealed in scripture. Each of the individual expositions of an attribute in life eternal is a sermon or a part of a sermon, and each is prefaced by a citation of a biblical text. The overall structure of, per of Preston's argumentation mirrors the reformed theologies of his era, albeit with some differences in the ordering of attributes. Once he has presented the existence of God in rational and rhetorical argument, conjoined with biblical testimony, he adds a sermon on Isaiah 46, 9, I am God and there is none like me, to declare that the biblical God is the true God 
Then follow two chapters on Exodus 3, 13 through 15, focused on verse 14. And God said unto Moses, I am that I am, serving as a foundation for the following exposition of divine attributes in general. This ordering of topics reflects a pattern of argument typical of early modern reform theology. Positioning a traditional essentialist reading of Exodus 3.14 as a biblical point of entry into an exposition of divine attributes in which faith and reason, theology and philosophy can join. The text also leads to a priority of the divine name, which he identifies as Jehovah Elohim in the exposition of essence and attributes, a model that's quite characteristic of his contemporaries, notably Paulinus, Trocasius Jr., Lulabius, and the Finch Downham sum of sacred divinity. I, I know I call it the Finch Downham sum because it's been recently shown by um, Randall Peterson that Downham, who licensed it, didn't write it. That Finch, who was left behind anonymously, is the actual author of the book. So Finch Downham. The text of Exodus 3, 13 to 15, not only provides Preston with a foundation for approaching discourse concerning divine essence and attributes, it also serves as the basic text for the sermons on divine perfection, eternity, simplicity, immutability, infinitude, immensity, and omnipotence. Drawing on the text, his next step in the argument is to declare how this essence of God is made known in a series of divine attributes. Here again, echoing contemporaries and predecessors like Zonke, Polanos, Cartwright, Preston adds that the divine attributes are of two sorts, either those that refer to God as he is in himself, or those that refer to God in relation to the world or to human beings. He notes that there are other divisions of the topic, but this is the best of which he is aware, quote, because it agrees with the scope of all the scripture. Is just, just one attribute. You were scared when I gave that list, I'm sure. Uh, I'm not going to do them all. Um, just divine eternity. Divine eternity provides a representative view of his method. He returns to the text of Exodus 3, 13 to 15, in order to make the point that Moses does not identify God as he that was, but as he that is, who says, I am that I am, not I am that was. And of course, no one can really say that. Um, which must needs, he says, indicate that God is without succession. In his brief introductory remarks, remarks Preston notes that God's self-identification as he that is implies that God is without all cause and accordingly eternal. And if eternal, therefore also without succession. He will subsequently reinforce this reading of Exodus 3 by collating the text with citations of Isaiah 57.15, Psalm 92 to 3 and John 8, 58, following a method that's characteristic of Puritan English reform preaching, he first offers a precise division of the topic to be used as an outline for the sermon. From the biblical text, he comments, readers and hearers may gather that God is eternal, a doctrinal point that he will expound in four ways. First, wherein this consists. Secondly, the reason why this must be so. Thirdly, the differences or distinctions. And fourthly, the consectories that flow from these distinctions of eternity. The first of these points, from Preston's perspective, is biblical and based directly on specific texts, rationally argued in accord with traditional exegesis. It's only in the second point that reason, the reason why this must be so, that introduces rational or natural argumentation. The differences or distinctions are matters of logical or rational argument, and the conclusions or consectories are a mixture of rational and biblical argumentation that quickly turns to the issue of uses of the doctrine for believers. Um, that, by the way, is, is a very standard model of a Puritan sermon, where you begin with the text, you line out a whole series of doctrinal arguments, and then you conclude with uses. It must be practical. It must address individuals and how they are to believe. The initial part of his argument, where in eternity consists, is divided into five related points of definition, grounded in biblical texts and the conclusions that can be drawn from them. Um, that, that, by the way, is the, is the standard hermeneutic, um, buttressed by the Westminster Confession, where doctrine is based on a text directly or on the conclusions that can be drawn from it. 
and the conclusions are logically drawn by collation with other texts. First then, eternity is an attribute of, quote, a simple but a living and most perfect being, and must be understood as a transcendent property belonging only to the most excellent and perfect being. This is not a matter of rational inference for Preston or his contemporaries, but the clear implication of the collation of Exodus 3, 13 to 15 with other biblical texts like Isaiah 57, 15. Thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place and so forth. Eternity is described as the most holy dwelling that creatures cannot attain. Second, eternity must also be understood as having no beginning or end, as may easily, he says, be gathered out of Psalm 92. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever that was formed, the earth or the world from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. Third, then, eternity has no ending. God is not described, God is described as not only from everlasting, but to everlasting. Fourthly, God's eternity must also be understood as successionless, in such a way that God is known to possess all things together, as it were, in an instant, as he says, indicated by John 8. 58, before Abraham was, I am. And fifth, God is also the dispenser of all time to others, the one from whom all time issues forth, which he says is yet another implication of Psalm 92 to 3. Once the biblical foundation for the definition of eternity has been deployed, Perkins turn, Preston, excuse me, I just wrote an essay on Perkins, and I'm getting confused. <laughs> um, Preston turns to the second main part of his argument, the reason why God must be eternal. Here the argument is purely rational, offering no biblical citations, introducing cosmological concerns concerning the foundation of nature, um, and also the ontological issue of motion in the universe and what it means for God to be truly ultimate. The argument for divine eternity rests on the conclusion reached in Perkins' previous sermons, that God is uncaused. The reason why God must be eternal is this, he says, because he is what he is of himself, he is without all cause, and therefore can have no beginning or ending, and therefore must of necessity be without all motion. Um, not that God doesn't relate or God doesn't connect with different places, but that God is not ontologically moved from lesser to greater, from better to worse, from worse to better. Um, all motion, he says, presupposes a cause and an effect. For whatsoever is moved is either moved from no being to being or from an imperfect to more perfect being. That is to be moved to a higher degree. Now God hath nothing in him but to be perfected, nothing in him to be perfected and is not capable of a further at higher degree, ergo, no ontological motion. Preston's argument is concise, tightly argued the statement, tightly argued statement of the logic underpinning traditional orthodoxy, stated in a manner reflective of both the natural and revealed theologies of his era. A derived being, not of himself, caused by another, he says, would not exist in the highest degree and would not be God. If uncaused, it can be no being either ontologically or temporally prior, yielding again the conclusion that God is without beginning. Moreover, if God is uncaused, there can be no end to his being, not ontologically, and therefore also not temporally. The conclusion that God must be without all motion also follows, he says, given that motion is understood, I would say ontologically, he obviously isn't using that word, as coming into being or advancing in being as opposed to a movement from place to place. Preston does not mention motion as dissolution of being or passing entirely out of being, but this is clearly ruled out as well. Since God is not caused, God is not subject to motion. Since he is not subject to motion, he is also without succession. And as much as succession would imply altered conditions or states of being. That's all in a sermon, mind you. Um, congregations had a lot greater tolerance for detailed <laughs> stuff then than they do today, um, at least most congregations. Um, the third main point of Preston's argument is also presented entirely rationally in the form of four differences between the eternity of God and the duration of all creatures. Even the highest creatures are not eternal. They are sempiternal at best, in Preston's words, having but half eternity. 
in as much as they have not always existed and therefore are not from everlasting, even though they may be too everlasting. Part of these creatures have a duration to eternity that they don't have intrinsically, but they have their duration from God and remain dependent on it. Third, this attribute of sempaternity, moreover, is not communicable. Angels may be eternal in the sense that they're immortal and have no end, but they're unable to make eternal things. This power is reserved to God. Fourth and last, all acts of creatures are characterized by succession. Whether inward acts such as thoughts or outward acts, all creaturely actions are characterized by flux and motion. Creatures are accordingly distinct from God, who is as a rock in the water that stands fast through the waves that move about it. That is, though the creatures admit of continual flux and succession about him as the waves do, yet there is none that can move him. Preston adds that these four differences constitute and explain the distinction between the eternity of God and the duration of creatures. Of interest here is that Preston, in a manner befitting the homiletical genre of his work, reflects without directly stating the distinction found in more scholastic theologies of this time between the successionless duration of God and the successive duration of creatures. Um, eternity is a changeless duration in relation to changing, mutating, temporal, and it is identified metaphorically as a rock that endures as waves churn about it. Finally, Preston presents two consectories or logical conclusions that follow from this exposition of divine eternity. The first of these consectories concerns the relationship of all times to God. As Psalm 90, 94 teaches, a thousand years in his sight are as but yesterday when it is past. God knows a thousand years yet to come as creatures fully know what is past. And he knows a thousand years past as if they were present. Because of the vastness of his being, Preston says, all things are present to God. He cites the simile often used, he says, by the schoolmen, citing none, none of them, by the way, <laughs> um, comparing God to a person standing on a high mountain and seeing all at once, all those who pass, even though they're spread out over a great distance, some before, others behind. It's the same with passing generations of human beings. All are present to God, even though they cannot all be present to one another. Since all time presence as is present to God, God cannot be subject to delay or expectation. He cannot be fearful of unknown things to come. He does not experience passions, whether of grief or pleasure, or any loss or gain of excellency as creatures do. Second consectory of eternity is it constitutes the enhancement of things that otherwise are valued only in their limited duration or in their separate existences. Here without stating his source, Preston clearly rests his argument on the much cited Boethian definition of eternity as the simultaneous and perfect possession of endless life, which becomes clearer through a collation or gathering, he says, of temporal things. Thus, what is good is infinitely more good, and what is evil is infinitely more evil if it lasts forever. The increase is also evident in regard of that collection into one, which is found in those things that continue to eternity, as when all joys are collected into one hope. Okay, so where is this going? A few conclusions. Preston's approach to the natural knowledge of God in his theology reflected the apologetic and pastoral uses common to reform thought in his time, particularly a worry over what is called practical atheism. Uh, these fellows frequently deny that there is any such thing as a genuine metaphysical atheist who really doesn't believe there is such a being called God. And if those people do exist, there are so few of them that nobody should worry about them. What you worry about is the practical atheism of hordes of human beings who act as if God doesn't exist. Whether in his large-scale patterns of argument, his use of scripture and reason, specific recourse to Exodus 3.14, or a sense of the content and proper place of natural theology of God in his thought, Preston carries forward the approaches of Reformed predecessors and echoes the work of his contemporaries. In other words, what he's saying is not profoundly original. What serves to distinguish his work from similarly elaborate continental theologies, 
and from many of his English contemporaries, um, was his use of the sermon as the primary vehicle of a large scale dogmatic exposition, a choice of genre that continued to be more common in Britain and on the continent after Preston, and with some exception um, being given to the Dutch in the um, second or not a Reformatie. If one asks the question of Perkins' place in the long term development of Protestant thought, he occupies not simply historically, but also attitudinally a midpoint between the patterns of Reformationary theology and those of the 18th century. He's departed from the running comment style of Reformation sermons like those of Calvin, but he's also refrained from textual presentation, doctrinal examination, and practical use model of many of his Puritan contemporaries. Uh, he, he does much more prefer a straight text exposition to rational argument. From a formal perspective, his presentation of the biblical text and its implications, followed by rational argumentation, looks not only toward later Puritan writings, but also to the style of latitudinarian sermons of folks like John Wilkins and perhaps even John Tillotson. His doctrinal content, however, is hardly latitudinarian. It belongs to the orthodoxy of the era, although it offers few evidences of scholastic argumentation. The evidence is an explicit and careful parsings of, parsing of the issues of reason and faith, more characteristic of Reformed Orthodoxy than that of Calvin, albeit maybe not more than Vermigli. He's a participant in the movement toward vernacular forms of theology, praying for the laity, characteristic of Second Reformation. And he is also characteristic of a movement toward more fully rational presentations of doctrine, characteristic of later 17th and 18th century Protestantism. Still, his usage, which references natural reason and natural knowledge of God, but doesn't reference natural theology as such, points toward an understanding of the genres of theological discourse and toward a view of the distinction between natural and sacred or supernatural theology that is substantially different from the disciplinary distinctions typically made in a more rationalistically inclined era. Arguably, arguably Preston would not have described the portions of life eternal that rested on natural knowledge and rational argument as an exercise in natural theology. Rather, his work evidences an assumption of the overlapping content and argument between knowledge resting on nature and reason and knowledge resting on revelation and faith. And it assumes an inclusion of natural knowledge and rational argument within the framework of sacred or supernatural theology, quite again in accord with the reformed orthodoxy of his time. In sum, Perkins incorporated rational arguments concerning the existence and attributes of God, nominally elements of natural theology, into what he understood to be a homiletical, but also quite reasonable body of revealed or sacred theology. That incorporation, moreover, was construed in terms of a specific understanding of the relationship of reason to faith that was neither fundamentally rationalist nor utterly fideist. For Preston, as for many of his reformed contemporaries, both British and continental, only rational creatures are capable of faith, and faith functions necessarily in and with their cognitive capabilities. He assumed the natural faculties and natural processes of knowing were necessary to the reception and understanding of supernaturally revealed truth. Faith presupposes the rational faculties. What Preston reveals about the reformed theology of his era then is a sense of the necessity and rectitude of the basic operations of reason and their place in theological argumentation without yet moving toward the rational assumption held by later latitudinarians and their continental counterparts that natural theology as a product of unaided reason provides a necessary foundation for revealed theology. He stands there in the middle. That's it. <laughs> Thank you. Now there is time for a question. If you're here already, go ahead. So, so th thank you for that wonderful paper on Preston. Um, I, I'm wondering, and this might be a clumsy way at, at, to kind of get my question, but as he discusses the natural knowledge of God, does he systematically or even occasionally distinguish between uh, a, a pre and post lapsarian? Uh, knowledge of God or, or a pre, pre or post-lapsarian context or does he does he 
does he distinguish between different subjects and what their knowledge of God might be? Okay. For sure, some yeah. of us are one assumed. Yeah. The, 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 short an the short answer is no. Um, <laughs> a longer answer is that he's primarily concerned with post-lapsarian natural knowledge and, and, and reason. Um, you can look to a contemporary, a previous just predecessor is like Francis Junius in this famous treatise on true theology, where Junius does line out natural theology. He, he first notes that there is such a thing as pagan natural theology, which of course he's going to say it's false, and it's largely philosophy. Um, but then there's then there's natural theology that he subsumes under the category of true theology. Before the fall, it was presumably better, although Junius doesn't line out its contents. Um, after, or at least presumably better access to God. After the fall, it is, it is problematic, it's distorted, it doesn't get to God's truth, but it still is there, and it's it's a form of true knowing. True, it has truths in it that are adulterated, um, that are mingled with falsehoods. But the, but the process of reasoning itself is fairly safe. One of, one of the, the, the issues that you see in, in the, most of the theologians of the era is that they do firmly believe in these common notions and in processes of reasoning that they, they don't view as tainted. So that, um, I really, again, just John Robinson, I, as I, I was reading him just yesterday or this morning, and he makes a point that all truth is from God, period. So that wherever you get it from, he says, whether it's a truth of reason or a truth of philosophy, it's going to agree with truth of scripture because all truth is from God. And then he even goes on to say that when the devil himself states truth, it's still true. You know, so that what, what you don't have in these writers is a case of saying, well, since Aristotle was a pagan, what he said is useless. If Aristotle said something is true, it's true, period. And there's no scholastic maxim that, that you know, the truth is neither increased or diminished. Truth is just truth. Um, so that you know, the, the truth that that chair is there is just as true as the, the truth that the Bible is God's word. Now, the truth of the Bible is God's word is a bit more important. But it's not more true. Truth is true. Unless you're Rudolph, Rudy Giuliani, and then it isn't. But <laughs> that's, a, that's an issue for other times, I guess. Are people able to hear anything you said? That would be like a oh, sure. Mic or does anyone ask the question? Yes, you mentioned uh, about the criteria to formulate doctrine. Mm. from Preston's perspective, which is foundationally from scripture, but with the reasons aid in terms of reaching the conclusions from the text, yeah. which is pretty, I mean, Thomas Aquinas does the same thing. It's pretty tradition from the Catholic perspective. Uh, today, most scholars, they're very resistant to this rational ingredient in terms of formulating doctrines, for instance, Lots of scholars, they are resistant to accept like divine simplicity, immutability, and others, uh, like the impassibility of God, because they think, oh, this is pure rationality or speculation. There's nothing to do with a specific text from scripture. I wonder if Preston had written about the simplicity, divine simplicity, and how he would defend the authority or the validity of simplicity in this textual and rational way at the same time. Because most scholars would say today that divine simplicity is 100% rational, but not scriptural. How he would tackle that problem? But he, he you know, I, I, I'm not, I don't have in my head which scripture text he cites at the time. But if you begin with biblical statements that God is spirit, then you immediately have something like simplicity. Because um, the opposite of simplicity is compositeness. Now, to be composite, you have to be a material being and capable of, of, of actual division. If you're a spiritual being, you're not, you're, not, you're not composed of parts the same way. You can't divide a spiritual being up um, because a spiritual being 
is, 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 not, is not composed of any, is not composed, is not material, can't be sliced and so forth. So you end up with the soul being simple and angels being simple. It's a characteristic of spiritual beings. Now, and so that, that seems to be very simple for, that's simple. It also, uh, simplicity, simplicity also means, means absolute. So that when you say that God is simple or most simple, you mean that there's, there's, a, there is a, there's an absolute undamageability of God's being. You know, and there, there you would, they would pull on such texts as, I am the Lord, I change not. Um, if God isn't changing, or and going back to the issue of the whole motion mutation issue, um, motion mutation imply changeable being, imperfect being, being that can get better or can get worse. And God can neither get better or get worse. And then, you, then you're back to the issue that, well, I can't make any, any kind of easy distinctions in God. Uh, that, that implies some kind of separability or composition. The same thing goes if you list all the divine attributes and you say, oh, okay, these attributes could be viewed as, as a composite. I mean, there, there was one evangelical theologian earlier, way, earlier in, in, I guess in the 20th century named Gordon Clark, who's notorious for the rather odd statement that God is the infinite sum of all true propositions. Um, a student asked me about that one time, and I said, well, that's obviously heretical. It's kind of goofy too, um, but but anyway, um, if, is God the sum of his attributes? Doctrine of divine simplicity says no. That's not the way it works. That the attributes all belong equally to the divine essence, and they are what God is. So that the goodness of a human being is separable from human being, but the goodness of God isn't separable from God. The life of a human being is definitely separable from human beings. It's not separable from God. So then you're back to a notion of simplicity again. Uh, simplicity basically means at the very bottom that God is what God is, period. Cannot be other. Cannot, does not change. And of course, a lot of modern theologians like to have God change. But the traditions balanced out all of those texts too. Hello, Bob. What I appreciate about the Puritans is their centrality of the word, but above all, the centrality of the word and the world. So my question is, to what extent did natural theology contribute to the rise of science? Now, well, there, there's a large literature, particularly go, going back to the mid 20th century, about Puritanism or Calvinism, Reformed theology, and the rise of modern science. Now, th now there, there's not an exact equation there. So it's, it's not as if there's no modern science that arises from places that aren't Calvinistic or Puritan, just as there's, not, there's, there's, there's a lot of capitalism that arises in places that aren't Calvinist. You know. Uh, no, no, thank you, Max Weber. Um, but it's quite the case that an appreciation of the natural order as a gift of God, an appreciation of rationality as a way as a way of accessing that natural order, does contribute to the the, the rise of early modern science. So that early modern science does thrive in reformed places, notably England and the Netherlands. Um, can you help me out? Where is the scriptural basis that says we are to use reason and or logic to help us understand the attributes of God? So, say, it, say it again. Uh, is there or where is the scriptural basis that suggests we should use logic or reason to understand the attributes of God? Yeah, I, I do think that you know, Pre Preston's, at least Pre Preston thought so. In, in his in his citation of Isaiah 64, that this does point to a God who is revealed in the in, in nature. The same, the same thing you, you, can, you can look at Paul in Acts 17. That the, the Greeks do know that there's one God. They've been taught this. 
Um, and then even in, in Romans 1.20, there is a sense that the, the invisible things of God are known. They're there for you to see. Now, you can make, you can make a distinction between, if you wanted to, and some of these 17th century folk do, between the pagan approach to this and the Christian approach to this. But the, the assumption is that a Christian certainly has enough divine grace and enough faith that the use of reason has been informed or eliminated. Um, and you know, they, I think that's a sound argument, but I'm not saying that there is a very specific, unequivocal part in scripture that allows us to take that leap and make that, that nexus. See, I mean, there, there again, I, I, would, I would say that if you ask Preston, I mean, don't, don't ask me. <laughs> I'm, just a, I'm just a historian. Um, no, but if you, if you ask Preston, Preston will say, sure, I just cited Isaiah 64, 4. I can cite you Romans 1, 20, and I can cite you um, Paul in Athens in Acts 17. And, you know, and probably find you more texts, but those are the ones that he'd be using, and he does. And, and the, the issue there is, again, the text and the conclusions you can draw from the text. And the, the, the conclusions you can draw from the text, which he does draw, are yes, indeed, God is, God is actually calling us to use our rationality to understand him in the world order. And then looking at the world order, you do come up with many of the attributes that are known to you by direct revelation in scripture. And this is also a point that they like to make. Um, Preston makes it, Turretin makes it, Maastricht makes it. I mean, I've seen it in Marasius, Asenius, a bunch of these guys who all point out that what you know from natural theology is not an add-on to revealed theology. It's not something that revealed theology doesn't know, and thank goodness there's natural theology to teach us that. No, no, no. It's, it's, a, it's a basic image of a lot of the things that scripture also teaches you and probably teaches you better. But it's included in, revel, in God's revelation. And now, of course, they also would assume that nature is, is a revelation. It's a book of nature that you should read. Thank you. In the thinking of Preston on natural theology, any trouble with Romans 1, that the instant the unbeliever knows from creation that there is God, he immediately turns that into the perversion of idolatry. Another way to express my question is, did it play a more positive role in Preston's theology than Paul allowed in Romans 1? No, no I, don't, I don't think so. Um, what Romans 120 gives you is similar to what Isaiah 64 gives Preston, the, the, the sense that, to quote more Cicero, there is not a nation, no matter how barbarous, that doesn't know that there is a God. And then, of course, sinful people distort that knowledge of God, but it's there. They can't ignore it. Um, so Ro Romans 120 does give you the understanding that knowledge that there is a God is available to all people. They, they don't use it rightly. And, and I, I think I mentioned Preston saying something like that. He points out that there is this terrible abuse of natural knowledge and of reason. But this doesn't undermine the fact that number one, reason itself is a gift of God. It can be misused that reason knows that there is a God, that reason can infer, if it's being used rightly, divine attributes from examining the natural order. So I don't think Romans 120 undermines that at all. It, it does mean, I think, that the knowledge of God that you gain from the natural order in sinful people is going to be distorted into various kinds of idolatry, paganism, whatever you want to call it. But it doesn't mean that it's not there. Anyway, that's what Preston would say. So I have a question about the, the sermons themselves. I mean, they are written texts. That's what we have. Yeah. Is there anything in the prefaces to the sermons in a form or anything that tells us what is the connection between what was actually preached and what is written, come down to us on paper? Because those aren't necessarily no. the same. Do we know anything? No. 
Um, it's too bad. Um, Preston left behind him a pile of manuscripts. And they, they may still exist somewhere and we could check them. But what's said in the, in the premises, as far as I recall, doesn't, doesn't tell you whether there's been much editorial work on the manuscripts. It also doesn't tell you whether he delivered his sermons off of the manuscripts or not. So no, we, we, to, to get from the text there to what was heard on those moments is, is almost impossible. Um, as, as also is, is exactly when he did it. Uh, you, you have um, sermons preached before the king um, and given that he died in 1628, it's Charles. Um, but that's all we know. We don't know when he, oh, no, we don't even know when he preached them. Um, I was uh, particularly fascinated by the genre with which he chose to address these very important themes. So my question is twofold. First, you mentioned that these were um, apologetic and um, pastoral, and you mentioned the context of um, practical atheists. But were there any sociological, political, cultural issues that he was particularly aware of that he wanted to address these issues in his sermons? And the second question, second part is, um, what are the things that a historian has to bear in mind when interpreting uh, people like Preston's sermons um, and, and sort of teasing out the theology out of the, and the thoughts out of their sermons? Okay. Now, Preston doesn't there again, I mean, he didn't write his own prefaces, and he doesn't, we don't have information about what he thinks is going on around him at the time he's preaching the sermons. Um, we can certainly infer from others um, so that there, there, are, there are numerous treatises that deal with things like crucifixes of God, and some of them are very pointed that what's swirling around us is a, a vast amount of practical atheism. And the practical atheism, in some cases, it will be associated with the, the rise of Renaissance Epicurean philosophy, where Epicureans don't deny that there's a God, but they view God as rather inoperative. And, and, you, and, the, and, and therefore, they fit into the practical atheist category. Um, William Perkins, when he talks about proofs of, proofs of God's existence and God's existence, he, he segues into a whole series of ramifications of what it means to ignore God. And, and there you have a clear sense of worries about the society. You don't see any of that, at least I haven't seen any of that in Preston. These are fairly urbane. Of course, if he was preaching them at court before the king, um, he probably wanted to be urbane. Or Perkins is considerably less so. Um, so no, you, you, can't tell, you can't infer a lot from him. You can infer a fair amount from others. Um, there's, there's a clear sense that they, that they think they have of the society, um, you might say, going to hell in a handbasket. And that they worry about this and they, they address their apologetics, including proofs. Um, there's also, certainly as the century progresses, a real worry raised by the encounter of Christianity with other cultures. So that there's, there's the apologetic gets increasingly pointed against other cultures and other religions. Although you already have that, at least in terms of, of, of Islam and, and Judaism in Mornay, you know, writing in the, in the 1580s. Okay, I think we have time for one more question. You, you started with a disclaimer and a teaser. Your disclaimer was about Preston's Puritanism. Your teaser was that this is one part of a larger project. Uh, do, do you have time just to summarize for uh, what what this is a, a part of? Okay. Yeah. Um, oh, I guess my, my my writing life, which is now extended for a while, is is a series of prequels. And you know, after my first project, I realized I said what I thought Protestant orthodoxy was not, and I was looking at a whole bunch of 19th and 20th century theories that were regnant at the time, like, oh, it's a predestinarian system that deduces everything from the doctrine of predestination, or deduces everything from the doctrine of God. He said, no, wait a minute, wait a minute, they're not doing that. That's not the way they operate. And I said it first that way, but then, then, then I said to myself, I need to ask myself, if that's not the way it operated, 
How does it operate? And then I decided, okay, I'm going to write a monograph, one book only, on prolegomena and Principia prolegomena scripture and God. And of course that turned into four volumes. And then I said to myself, now, wait a minute, there's a lot of philosophical background here. So that instead of going on to write about predestination, which had been my primary choice of what to do next, I said, no, 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 I want to look at the, at the, the, the philosophy, the epistemology, metaphysics. So I've got a project that started out as natural theology, turned into a project on natural religion and natural theology, and a project that relates natural theology to metaphysics. And if I ever finish it, it's going to be two volumes. Mm -hmm. And so this is a little piece of that, a tiny piece of it. Um, and, as, and as I try to write this stuff, I keep on saying to myself, well, you, know, you can't just keep on expanding this, these blasted volumes. You, you need to take some pieces out that you don't have to write about in the volume and do it somewhere else. So there's Preston. Very good. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Uh, just uh, before we thank you again, we will have a break immediately outside again. Four. We'll be back in here. Thank you.